Hello, everyone. Welcome to Traversing Data Landscape CTDL Schema Crosswalks Planning Session. I am Jeannie Kitchens, Chief Technology Services Officer with Credential Engine, and I am joined today by Phil Barker, a longtime partner with the CTDL, and Simone Ravielli, um, who is a CTDL Advisory Group Chairperson and also Director of Global ecosystem and innovation with Parchment. And I have multiple colleagues with Credential Engine with us, including Deb Everhart, who I just mentioned. And we want to thank all of you for joining today. We truly appreciate you taking the time. Um, I'm going to go over the uh, agenda items today and um, <clears throat> talk a little bit about Credential Engine. We notice in the registrations there are some folks who may not know too much about us. And then we're going to get into today's topics, which is about CTDL schema crosswalks. Why do it? Pre pre uh, presented by Phil, um, using the data ecosystem schema mapper tool for CTDL schema crosswalks, also covered by Phil. Phil's going to do a lot of talking today. <laughs> Planning and scoping these crosswalks, also by Phil. And then Simone and I will talk about um, an example of a crosswalk that's currently happening and some next steps. So before we dive into the main topics in our agenda, for those of you who may be new to Credential Engine, we are a nonprofit. We have a mission of mapping the credential landscape. And um, we do that through programs, partnerships, um, in particular, deep and lasting partnerships and collaborations and technologies. And let me go quickly over those technologies in just a moment. <clears throat> um, I had mentioned that we're joined by other Credential Engine team members. Um, and this is a list of our CTDL team responsible for the CTDL advisory group. And again, with Simone as our chairperson. Uh, so the credential engine technologies begin with the credential transparency description language. The CTDL is foundational to all of our work. It is a very large description language. It is available for anyone to use under Creative Commons open license. And um, the information about it is, is transparent on our technical site that anyone can access without a password. Um, as we uh, go through today's um, topics, we'll drop links in the chat, and we'll also be posting this information online, so no worries if you don't, don't catch all of it. We also uh, manage, maintain, and develop an entire suite of publishing tools. We do not develop um, tools directly for example students or faculty, but we do create tools for the purpose of converting information into CTDL linked open data structure and publishing that data to the registry. We maintain the credential registry, which of course is CTDL linked open data structure. And you can use the credential finder, a tool for seeing that data, um, to see the data in the registry. And of course, the purpose of the registry is to make the data available for other systems, web applications, and so forth to use. As I mentioned, the credential transparency description language is a very large language. This slide is meant to show you, um, give you a good, good idea of the depth and breadth of the CTDL on the right-hand side. The image shows <clears throat> the little circles with um, the types of data adjacent to those circles that the CTDL supports. And the arrows are notional, but play an important purpose in this picture, showing that the data is all meant to be linked together. Um, the slide also has some URLs that we can share in the chat, um, including the CTDL handbook. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Phil to start talking about CTDL mappings. Why do it? Phil. Thank you, Jeannie, for that introduction to Credential Engine and CTDL. Um, I'm going to cover some of the more technical parts of the presentation. Um, and I want to start by explaining why we do mapping and crosswalks. Um, and the fact is that CTDL lives in a world that needs many standards, many different data models. 
the picture here is one that some of you might recognize. Uh, it's taken from edmatrix.org, which is an attempt to map out um, the areas of coverage of some of the standards that are relevant to educational technology. Um, you'll see that it's divided into four vertical strands, um, data dictionary, logical data model, serialization and protocol, which are different aspects of a standard. Um, not every standard covers all four. Um, but more relevantly to us, there are different areas that are covered, which are shown as the blue horizontal bars. Um, and different standards will cover different areas within um, the, the area or overall domain of learning data. And if I had been able to show you something similar for the world of employment, um, you would have seen a similar amount of complexity, possibly even more. The um, verticals would probably have stayed similar or stayed the same, but those horizontals, some of them will still be relevant. Organizational data, personal and identity data would still be relevant. Others would not be relevant and some other new ones would be introduced. Um, so even within one domain of education, you have lots of different areas that are covered by different standards. Um, in other domains, you'll have other areas to cover. And the key point is that people in different domains or dealing with different areas have different use cases to consider. You know, they might be using similar data, but they want to do different things with that data. They'll have different incumbent technical systems, some of which will have a long history. And, you know, the, the standards that are covered, uh, are supported by the incumbent technical systems, um, are the standards that have to be used within that, that domain or that area that they, they tend only to change quite slowly. Um, and, you know, one reason why the different systems have different standards is because they have different technical requirements, which themselves are built often on different, different business practices uh, and sometimes different legal requirements. So just to reiterate where I started, we live in a world that needs many standards. On the next slide, please, Jeannie. Um, we also live in a world where all of these different data ecosystems, the, the you know, standards that are used in different domains are interconnected. Um, individuals, you, me, and everybody else, um, spend our time moving between world of education and the world of employment. Uh, we have some data that we use ourselves, um, personal information about us, some of which we manage either directly or indirectly using um, web-based services. Um, and so the different domains and different areas can't live within silos, they can't ignore each other. The same data has to be moved around between those different domains, um, will be referenced by individuals when they want to talk about, for example, you know, what educational um, experience they had by way of the courses they went to, the institutions they went to, the uh, most importantly, the uh, verifiable credentials they obtained and the, the skills and competencies they obtained. You know, they'll be talking about what they did how they acquired those from an educational setting, but wanting to communicate to employers and businesses. Uh, and so the, the data cannot um, stay within nice, neat, grid-like structures, um, can't be siloed. Um, and we all suffer if the, the data is um, fragmented, if the ecosystems are fragmented and not joined together. So that's background to you know why we're in a world that, first of all, needs many different standards, but secondly, needs data that can traverse across the ecosystem, across the landscape of those different standards. Um, the next slide um, it is reiterating, really, that we need tools and strategies to unlock the potential of data within the ecosystems um, to provide consistent information, including 
information about credentials, competencies, and skill data. Uh, and this is getting to the, um, the core of Credential Engine's mission, which is to empower individuals to find the best, path best pathways that they can um, along their educational and occupational journeys in life. And on the next slide, um, we begin to get into the, the area of mappings and crosswalks. And a couple of points of clarification. Um, I'll try to use mapping to refer to the intellectual activity of analyzing two or more metadata schemas or data models. So the mapping is the intellectual work of working out how one metadata schema relates to another. And a crosswalk is the, the output of that process. It's um, visual, technical, human readable or machine readable um, output of a mapping. And when you're doing the mapping, when you're doing the, um, uh, the, the, the actual process of creating a crosswalk, there are two different things to, to think about. One is the, um, the intellectual mapping, if you like, the, the semantic interoperability, comparing the definitions that there are within um, the data dictionary, for example, comparing the different data models, how they fit together uh, at a conceptual level and at a definitional level. Then there's the technical mapping, which focuses more on the syntactic and structural interoperability. How do you actually um, encode the data in something like XML or JSON-LD or you know what, whatever your favorite serialization is for, for data? Uh, and how do you deal with um, some of the details of um, what data um, is conveyed within the same element and what data is split between different elements? Um, the DESIM tool which, tool, which we're going to go on to talk about shortly, um, focuses primarily on the intellectual mapping. Um, the comparison of different data models and vocabularies within those data models with some limited attention to noting technical mapping issues. Um, next slide, please. Why do we do this? What, what is the value of producing a crosswalk? Um, the first thing is to avoid unnecessarily proliferation of content standards um, by knowing what already exists. Um, and also within that, making sure that if you do create something new, you do so in a way that is compatible with what already exists. Um, crosswalks, the, 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 um, the DESIM tool helps make these crosswalks among the relevant data models clear and transparent. Uh, I think we'll be showing you a bit later how um, DESIM2 will publish a human readable and machine readable version um, of a crosswalk. Um, you can compare, determine and compare the level of expressivity within each data model in comparison to the other models, which can be useful to identify um, the common attributes within the different data models and things which perhaps only one data model deals with because it's needed for its particular niche. Um, help determine whether new terms should be added to um, a schema that you're managing. You know, for us, that's CTDL, but other people manage other schemas and will find similar value. Um, provide information that's needed to determine how um, existing terms should be related. Sorry, this one's quite technical. Um, if you're creating a schema such as CTDL, it's very useful to encode within that schema information about how it relates to other already existing data models and vocabularies and schemas. Um, and the um, DESM mappings help you do that. It will support aggregation, repurposing, transforming, of metadata that's expressed in different data models. Support it, but DESIM doesn't actually do the translation. It provides the mapping that's, or the crosswalk rather, that's required for a tool that does the translation. And uh, 
I think I covered this when I was talking about one of the earlier ones, but um, it, it's very useful for finding gaps within your data model. If, if you find there's something that's dealt with by most of the other models in your domain, um, you might want to fill that gap. Next slide, please, Jeannie. So that's talking about um, crosswalks and mappings in general. Um, a few points I want to make about what DESIM, Data Ecosystem Schema Mapper tool, does. Um, it's designed to support and sustain mapping projects. Um, the projects are, yeah, di di sustain the, the actual projects that do the mapping. Um, the mappings are agnostic as to the, the data formats or serializations that are used by the different um, schemas or standards or data models. Um, mappings can be between an arbitrary number of data standards um, through the generation of a, an artificial or synthetic spine to which each data standard is mapped. And I'll come back to explain what, a, what the synthetic spine is later. Um, and DESIM supports numerous use cases, such as mapping schemas across different standards uh, or clarifying the relationships among different data definitions for particular areas, for example, rubrics or micro-credentials. Let's move on to the next section where I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about what, what using DESIM for a schema mapping looks like. First of all, some acknowledgements for the, the, the background and history of DESM and um, sort of where, where it is now, how it got there. Um, credit for the idea and the leadership to make that idea into a real existing tool belongs to Stuart Sutton. Thank you, Stuart, for your work on this. Um, the funding came through the T3 initiative of the US Chamber of Commerce Foundation. Um, with money coming from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and Walmart.org. Um, Jeannie and I took over the um, took over the running of the development project after um, Stuart stepped down. The technical development has been done by our partners at Learning Tapestry. And that technical development has been going on since mid-2021. Uh, the end of last year, running to the beginning of this year, we ran a pilot study um, examining the ability to support mapping um, between different um, data standards that exist in educational technology um, and looking at the utility of the crosswalks. The US Chamber of Commerce Foundation host a running instance um, of DESM, which is what we've used for uh, mapping projects so far. Um, however, the software is available from GitHub. It's open source, runs under a, a, an Apache 2.0 license. So anybody who wants to set up their own instance um, can do so in order to support mappings for any domain that's of interest to you. And Credential Engine is standing up an instance of our own. Uh, and I think Jeannie might be, well, Jeannie won't be able to answer any questions on availability of that instance. Um, let's move on to the next slide. What does the mapping tool do? Um, it provides a facility, a user interface, to manage mappings between terms in different standards or different data models. Um, it does not make the intellectual aspects of mapping easy. It, it requires a certain level of experience and expertise in order to do sensible mapping between different standards or data models. And that's always going to be the case, whatever tool that you use. What DESM does is it makes it easy to record and share human and machine readable uh, results of the mapping activity. Um, 
The crosswalk shows how to transform the data, but DESIM does not support data trans transformation directly. And mappings are created as pairwise relationships between properties from the standard or data model that's being mapped and a synthetic spine um, for one or more abstract domain classes. Um, and those terms that are in bold, I'm going to um, define in more detail shortly. Um, it can also support mappings of enumerations of allowed values. So if, if you've got a particular property within your standard that, and you've got a list of values that need to be from, from which you need to choose one or more in order to provide a value for that property, uh, you can map between um, different uh, different controlled vocabularies, different enumerations. So a property, uh, let's start with some of these definitions of what was in bold. A property is a representation in data of a characteristic of the thing that's being described or a relationship between two things. So it could be the name of the thing that's being described. That's a characteristic. It could be the uh, a description of the thing that's being described, another type of characteristic. Or it could be a relationship. So you could say that, um, uh, yeah, my name is Phil, uh, my parents are whoever and whoever. Uh, the second, you know, describing my parents is describing a relationship between me and somebody else. You, if you've used um, you know, technical formats before, you'll recognize perhaps that a, a property as being what in RDF, Resource Description Framework, we call a property. In XML, it gets called an element. Uh, in a database table, it would be a, a column. Um, and if you use um, something like JSON, which has name value pairs, it would be the name of the name value pair. So one of our issues in dealing with a whole range of different um, description frameworks uh, is that the same thing gets called different by different terms in different places. And sometimes be aware that the same name, the same term is used to describe different things in different, um, uh, di di different places. Let's move on to the next slide. Okay, so the next thing that I said I would um, explain is the abstract domain class. This represents the, the area of concern, what you're mapping. So the example that I've shown are um, how different standards deal with a rubric. They break it down into typically three separate classes. Sometimes there's a, a fourth class that um, plays a, a role related to one of those three central classes. You won't be able to read what those classes are, but it's rubric, rubric criterion, and rubric level or rubric criterion level. They get called different things, but they, they have um, the, the same functions. Um, and th this is, if you like, the the best case scenario, because the modeling of the domain of rubric is the same in these four classes, so in these four standards. That's not always the case. Sometimes the same thing is modeled in very different ways. Um, the abstract domain class doesn't have to be the same as a class in the data models that are being mapped, but sometimes it is. Um, uh, when Stuart um, did a mapping of rubrics. Um, we had just a single class of rubric and mapped all of the, um, the the properties to that one abstract class without concerning ourselves too much um, where in the data model it, it fitted. Uh, that's an example of collapsing um, the, 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 the way a, a data standard will break down a domain into several classes, um, into back, collapsing it into one class. Um, Sometimes the differences in domain modeling make mapping the data classes very difficult. Uh, it's one of the things that you, you need to be aware of and you need to think about before you do any mapping. 
Next slide. Um, I think we can skip this slide, Jeannie. That's just more detail on the, the rubric class um, classes that were shown there. Um, the other th term that I said that I would um, uh, define is the synthetic spine. Um, the synthetic spine represents a, a fusion of all of the relevant properties from the different data models that are being mapped. Um, and I'm going to go through in some detail how you build the synthetic spine. Uh, and then at the end, I'm going to show how that works to function, how, how that works to support mappings between the different um, data models. At the start of any mapping activity, um, you have a synthetic spine for each of the domain, the abstract domain classes um, that you have, and it's empty. Um, you then import your first schema, you know, your first data model, um, and you seed the synthetic spine with the properties from that schema. Basically, you copy, you make copies of each of the properties from the first schema to go in into the synthetic spine. And so on the next slide, you see that those, uh, the synthetic spine now has copies of all of the properties that were in schema one. Um, and because they are literally verbatim copies, the mapping from schema one to the synthetic spine is trivially easy. Um, each one is identical. Each property in schema one is identical to the property in the synthetic spine. Um, you then load in your second schema, which is on the next slide. And what you'll find is that some of the properties may be identical to the um, property that's in the synthetic spine that came from the first schema. Some might be just rewordings of what's definitionally the same. Um, some might be a narrow match, um, which is to say that the um, the property in the spine covers a, um, has, has a narrower scope than the property that you're um, mapping from. So the um, property three in schema two covers a broader range of data than property three in the spine. Sometimes it might just be similar. And sometimes you get the, um, you, you'll find that there's something in, in the schema that you've just loaded that isn't in the spine. And so you can extend the spine um, by copying in any properties that were missing. And of course the mapping there is that, uh, is that the two will be identical to each other. Um, and then in a way, it's a case of rinse and repeat. You, you load in your, your third schema. Uh, on the next slide, Jeannie. Um, and you'll get different mappings. Um, but what you tend to find as you load more schema in is that there becomes less and less need to add new properties to the synthetic spine. You know, eventually, you, you've added in everything from um, all of the schemas. Um, so, you know, all, all the data that, that's covered in a particular domain will be present in the synthetic spine. Uh, we call it a synthetic spine because it's a, a synthesis of all of the properties that are in the different schemas that you're mapping. Um, it's, um, you know, built by a combination, if you like, of the, the different elements of all of the different schemas that you have. Um, and moving on to the next slide. The mapping predicates, these are the relationships between the schemas that you've put in and the um, properties in the spine, in the synthetic spine, are things that can be defined separately for each mapping project. Um, and the examples that we've been using are shown on the screen here identical, which means that the definition is the same. So 
one schema might have name, which is defined as being the name for something. Um, another schema might not have English labels for the um, properties, but might use you know, numeric code. So 002 defined as a name for the thing. The definitions are the same. So the, um, the, the two properties are in effect identical to each other. Um, next best match is reworded where the meaning is the same. For example, a name for something and the name of an item. So the meaning is the same, but they are differently expressed. Then you have broad match and narrow match. So a broad match means that the property in the spine is broader. It encompasses the meaning of the property being mapped and other meanings. So name uh, encompasses the saying, the meaning of phone, phone name. You know, if name is defined as a name for something and phone name is a person's phone name, then the first of those covers a broader range of possibilities than the second. So it's a, a broad match for the second. Uh, narrow match is similar, but the other way around. We have a, a property of transformed, which means that you can get to the spine value um, through some hopefully simple transformation of the data. So full name could be a combination of given name and family name. And finally, the, the um, well, there, there, there are others actually, that, that there's the possibility of showing no match, but we, we shan't go into when you'd want to do that. Um, sometimes they're just similar. You know, you, you, they've got similar intent, but there are significant differences. So family name is kind of similar to patronym, but they have different meanings and you, you can't really, um, they, they might be equivalent in some contexts, but not all. Um, which mapping predicates are useful for you will depend on the reason why you're doing your mapping project. Um, you know, if you want to be able to do phone data transforms from data in one standard to data in another standard, then you need certain properties, certain mapping predicates only won't work. Um, similar will not work. If, however, you're just doing a, a gap analysis, then things like similar might be you know, adequate to show whether you've got a gap or perhaps you're just filling that gap by doing something that's similar intent, but in intent, but you know, handling it different because of your use case. So let's move on to the next slide. So I promised I'd show, you know, the, the aim, of course, isn't to create a synthetic spine. The aim isn't to map all of these different schemas to a, a, a synthetic spine. The aim is to be able to map from one schema to another. But you can do this via the synthetic spine properties if they have the right functions, if you have the right combinations of, of, of properties, of, of um, predicates, mapping predicates. So on the top of these, uh, the, the, sorry, the first of these two diagrams show that um, schema property one was identical to the spine because it was copied there. Schema property, schema two property one also happened to be identical to the spine and schema three property one was just a rewording of, of what's in the spine. These are all functionally equivalent. So a value for any one property can be used as a value for the others. That's a win. That means that you can do a, a, a fun technical mapping. The second shows a slightly more complicated um, situation. A broader match means that any value for the property in schema three can be used as a pro for a property for what's in the spine and hence for what's in schema one, because the spine covers a broader range of possibilities. It covers all the possibilities for um, that property four covers and some others. So you can move, you can translate data from um, schema three to schema one. You can also translate data from schema three to schema two because narrower match is broader if you turn it in the other direction. So 
schema th um, um, schema two property three covers all of the data that could be in um, in the spying property four. You can't do it the other way around, though. You can't map from a broad match to a narrow match because it's only some of the data that's in the broader category that would fit in the narrower category. So only some mappings will work in this case. And let's move on to the next slide. Um, this is the is a screenshot from the output of the rubric mapping that I mentioned earlier that Stuart did for us. Um, and it shows that there is an element within rubrics called benchmark um, in the spine. Um, it came from the ASN um, standard, uh, Achievement Standards Network standard for rubrics. Um, and you can see that it is identical, of course, to the property from the Achievement Standards Network. It is reworded in CEDS and Panella and Cola, which are the two of the other standards. And it is similar to a property in the IEEE standard. So this shows you, you know, that it does actually work out sometimes with real, real data models, real standards. Um, you can perform the mapping and you can get um, uh, crosswalks that will be useful for translating data or just for comparing how different standards deal with similar data. Okay, I think that's it for my overview of DESIM and how it how DESIM works and why you would use it. Um, just give me a second. <clears throat> Thank you, Phil. That was a great, um, great overview. And I know Deb has been watching the chat. I've been watching the chat. I think we're okay with questions, but just as a reminder, everyone, if you have questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat. And at the end, we'll hope to have some time to maybe raise hands and you know, unmute to ask questions as well. Um, but before we go on, um, Simone, any any comments, commentary on that first section? Maybe a commentary that uh, could be picked up in a further conversation around the scope of this tool, which it doesn't do everything. I mean, it does a crosswalk, but not necessarily the the intellectual aspect of mapping. And and I thought, you know, as, as we reflect about the the relationship between the emerging um, large language language models or AI, so and structured data, what is their relationship? And I think they, you know, to to, to train a good AI, you need you know good structured data, and you could actually turn unstructured data into structured data through AI, as the recent Experience U project uh, by the T3 Innovation Network showcase. So that is um, room and food for thought on how might we uh, further streamline the process of mapping or make it more efficient, even when it comes to the intellectual mapping, given that we have available tools for the crosswalk. Yeah, that and is a great presentation on how um, large language models and knowledge graphs um, relate to each other, which covers lots of points that are really relevant to, to what you've just said, Simone. Um, that the thrust of it is that um, uh, large language models are, are very exp very expensive. Um, they are difficult to check. Uh, it's difficult to know what they're doing in the background. They they lack certain things like um, they're not language independent um, and and several other things. Um, mappings such as the you know things that uh, Desim does and you know and knowledge graphs in general um, fill in those gaps. So you know if you could get a large language model to do a transformation, um, then you could load that data into DESIM. Um, you could publish it in a way that was far cheaper than having to derive it from fresh 
every time uh, it would be human readable you'd be able to look at it to examine it to know what it was actually doing which is very difficult with the large language model you'd be able to translate it all sorts of useful things like that very good good topic and great points okay so um on to planning um a, a mapping project um the challenges that we found that you face um you might have different framework paradigms um and what i mean by this is that there are some radically different ways to modeling data not just different data models um, but approaches to modeling data for example you've got graph-based models such as rdf you've got hierarchical models such as xml and json you've got relational databases you've got object-oriented programming um, all of these model data in different ways and if it's modeled in a different ways it becomes more difficult to map and layered on top of that as i mentioned earlier is that you have different terminology uh, and that includes using the same term with different meanings so what's a property in one um, paradigm might be an element in another paradigm um, what's an object might vary between paradigms an object in rdf is different to an object in object-oriented programming once you get to a level below that um, uh, if you're modeling using something like an entity relationship um, approach, which most most models will do, um, there might be different entity relationship modeling choices that are made. Uh, I showed an example of rubrics where the uh, the choices that have been made in various different standards are, are quite similar. Uh, if you look at courses, for example, um, the modeling entity relationship models are, are very different between different standards and the final challenge is that few people have the expertise and experience of working across many data models um, th there'd be few individuals who would be able to do um, uh, who would be able to do um, models across all the different data models that exist in their area of domain so their domain of expertise um next slide um we found that uh a lack of shared understanding about the scope and purpose of a mapping leads to poor results so planning and scoping is absolutely key to a successful mapping project um and we think at the moment this is our you know shot at some sort of steps that things that you need to consider as you're setting up a mapping project define the project what are the data models that are relevant and what do you wish to achieve um, by creating a crosswalk as i mentioned earlier um doing a crosswalk to get actual data translations is very different from doing a crosswalk just to find gaps within a particular um, schema or across a, a range of data models. Form a team. As I said, no one person is going to have all of the expertise that's required. You need a team. You need experts in each data model and you need people who understand how the data is used, you know, what the use cases are that each, uh, each standard or data model has been created to, to fulfill. Um, map the data in outline uh, what types of entity are important how are they handled within each data model and then you're in a position to decide the project details such as the the abstract classes um, the mapping predicates that you'll use and which model will be the first that you put in which schema will be the first schema that you load which is important because that seeds the spine and if you get that right then you avoid the situation where you're having to add too many too, too many um, new properties to the spine as you go along um, then you need to set up a configuration profile for the project in DESM and do the mapping in DESM which requires a certain amount of coordination of the work um, you need to talk to each other while you're doing it so that you can discuss questions that are arising and the reason why you need to coordinate the work is so that you're all at a similar stage and you can um, discuss where you are at that stage 
uh, and communication is absolutely key to getting consistency between the different team members. Um, and then once you've completed the mapping, you, you can check it and publish it. But you expect this to be an iterative process. It, it's not a one-stop sequence. Um, one shot sequence. Next slide, please. Um, there are different roles within a, a, um, a mapping um, project, which range from you know facilitator who works with the mappings to define the the project, um, administrator who can set up a configuration profile within Desim, um, the mappers who do the work that includes uploading the schemas and then mapping them. Own, um, only certain mappers, or you can choose to have certain mappers who can say yes, this is done. Um, and then there's the, the final output user um, who uses the map, the, the crosswalks that have been created. And I think that is it for me. I expect people are very tired of my voice by now. Well, you sounded very good and clear throughout your entire presentation. So thank you. That was a lot. <laughs> that was definitely a lot of airtime for you. So thank you for that. Um, and we've been watching the chat. We did get one question in the chat. What about data equity and ensuring we're building data models for equity and inclusion? Any thoughts and reflection on this project and how you may have built this into the project? So I think that could be part of scoping. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it would be part of scoping um, and part of the selection process of the um, models that you choose and part of, as sorry, I see Deb's just got put something in the chat, um, uh, part of choosing your team. Yeah, you, you have to um, understand the uses that the data is being put to in order to um, get the mappings right. Um, and it can be very important, for example, uh, when you get to um, deciding on equivalences between properties. And I did slip one in that uh, I, I don't know if any of you noticed, but I, uh, I, I had an example of um, Fung name being equal to, I think it was given name plus family name. And that is only true in some conscious. It's not true in unconscious. So... You, know, you need awareness of the data equity issues if you're going to get this this mapping right. And Deb, you have your hand raised. Do you want to go ahead and unmute? Yeah, I would just say that, I mean, this is an important point that ties into a, a, a broader perspective that's relevant for all mappings, which is that this is a human process for human purposes, right? So when you see these tools and synthetic spine and specialized terminology, it all sounds very geeky. But the reason for doing these mappings is to um, find the similarities and differences in schemas and how better clarity can support important use cases. So I just wanted to tie it back not only to Kelly's important question about equity and inclusion, but about the human purposes of mapping in general. Thank you, Deb. <clears throat> Okay, um, we are at 8.51, so we need to move along here. That was great background though. Clearly there was a large education component of this webinar that we wanted to have intentionally to help uh, people understand what a mapping is, why do it, and how to use DESM tool for those mappings. Um, this is a great example. I dropped a link um, in the chat that everyone can look at. This is a real mapping. Um, Phil also used that example in a prior slide. Um, if it didn't automatically default to see the screen <clears throat> shot that you see, then just use the drop down menu and select rubric mapping for CTDL. And as we already pointed out, you'll be able to see the spine and the multiple um, <clears throat> uh, schemas that were used to do that mapping. Um, this is a listing of the um, schemas that were used to produce that uh, mapping. And we have to give thanks again to Stuart Sutton, who did that mapping with DESM, and he mapped the listing of all of these 
uh, schemas here, with the exception, I should say, though, of the one attack case, and I believe that is in, in progress, and um, case team is working on it. So um, that is in progress. Um, but just additional information, again, to see a real-world example. This is actually being used with a CTDL rubrics task group that is um, in uh, actually getting ready to do its last meeting tomorrow, and we uh, were able to use that mapping to really help um, develop the CTDL uh, terms proposal that is coming out of that task group. So we have a CTDL advisory group. All of you who are not a member of it are welcome to join, right? Simone, the more the merrier is always our attitude. <laughs> the more collaboration and the more input we have, the better. <clears throat> As part of that um, group right now, we are working on what we call credential transparency opportunities discussion. And <clears throat> we're framing um, a list of potential projects around vision, goals, strategy, and collaboration. And um, Simone, let me turn it over to you for a minute just to kind of share a little more information about um, that activity and um, <clears throat> how we're going about it. Sure, thanks, Jamie. Well, simply put, I think, generally speaking, what Credential Engine has developed over the years is too good to be kept a, a confined inside any territorial boundaries. And so with the advisory group, we've been really trying to uh, identify what might be uh, suggestions for Credential Engine in sharing the best practices with the global audience and be more intentional around what opportunities uh, we may tackle or suggest that Credential Engine take on. Clearly, when we talk about global interop, um, mapping uh, comes up a lot. Um, to Deb's point, interop is really a human coordination effort before being a technical thing. Um, and so this group is really open to anyone uh, to sit in, contribute, and, and explore ways in which we can make credential engine assets uh, more useful. Now, one Mm, opportunity that we identified that connects to the data ecosystem schema mapper was to look at the existing um, and uh, emergent world of micro-credentials, where even just when it comes to a definition of micro-credentials, there are different takes on it. And so while you know it, it seems that an effort to map the definition be worthwhile, we wanted to go a step um deeper and really try to make sense of micro-credentials from um, the ways in which the existing guidance, the political guidance around micro-credentials frameworks around the world is identifying what data elements should constitute a micro-credential. This is both for, pu for publishing purposes, so to advertise a learning opportunity, but also downstream to credential it. And so we've been collecting examples of this kind of guidance, information models, if you will, uh, from different regions. Australia and New Zealand have their micro-credentials framework. Europe has one as well, but there are other similar initiatives. And suggesting to use the DESM tool or DESM tool to do a mapping on micro-credentials. So make sense, do that crosswalk that, that <clears throat> Phil was talking about earlier. Um, and so we have a, a, a basic, mapping project document that uh, Gene is up here on the slide. Um, and it's a call for, for participation. And, and we'll define the next steps, but scoping down an opportunity to do another mapping around micro-credentials felt timely uh, and something that uh, would be within reach um, of Credential Engine and its advisory, extended advisory board. Does that make sense? Is that? Okay, enough as of a sort of a preview or a teaser. Yeah, and I think thanks for that, Simone. And so we we really wanted to lay out kind of the value of mapping. And as Deb, as Credential Engine's Chief Strategy Officer, would want us to keep pointing out that it's not just about doing the mapping for the sake of doing a mapping, right? It's really a foundational and very important activity. And when we look at that opportunities document that was created through the input of CTDL advisory group members, when the more you analyze the information, <clears throat> the opportunities um, tend to 
first require this kind of a mapping. So it's really just a, a tool and a part of the journey that's very informative and valuable. And let me see, Deb, did you want to add something to that? No, I was just going to type in the chat. I mean, this particular opportunity bringing greater clarity to this rapidly evolving world of micro credentials is a very exciting opportunity. So thank you, Simone. Yes. I, I, I like the idea of giving micro credentials a spine uh, so they could stand on their own feet. I think it's a, it's a good uh, analogy. It, you know, frankly, this is very important and we are we should be thankful because our policymakers are reaching toward us and giving us you know better ideas what kind of information they want to see disclosed for these micro credentials to have quality to be accredited eventually and to be legit um, and so serving that purpose of creating this infrastructure the crosswalk is really important it's certainly not a walk in the park uh, but uh, it's one walk that I think it's worthwhile, um, you know, setting uh, setting on. So, and it feels like it's actually reasonably scoped. Uh, just to give you a sense, and most of the guidance, the, the information models that we've seen, do not encompass that many data elements. I mean, it's up to twenty. So, it this should be a low hanging fruit with high visibility that proves the value of mapping tools that has global uh, resonance and certainly uh, would become very useful in making sense of, of micro-credentials, just not sticking with agreeing on a universal definition, which is not going to happen. I think we can say that now, but you know, making sure that we have ways to interpret, recognize credentials wherever they're um, issued. Thank you, Simone. And with that said, we are at the last minute. Um, <clears throat> we always conclude this type of a webinar with next steps, call to action, right? So, um, you know, join the CTDL advisory group uh, to participate with these types of activities. If you're a potential mapper, um, or if you're not, and you can connect us with those who you think may be potential mappers for such a project, let us know. Um, participate, actively participate with it, advancing this work by providing additional use cases and solutions and empower people using transparent data. <laughs> so all these opportunities are available for your input and um, watch for um, additional upcoming information and webinars as a follow-up to this one. And thank you all for joining. We truly appreciate it. Any closing words, Simone, Phil, or Deb? Thank you, everybody, for listening. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Have a great Bye. day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.